This is World to Win, bringing you the latest news and analysis from a socialist perspective. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of World to Win. We're really excited about this episode, and uh, we're really excited to have so many new subscribers with us today. So we've passed 1,200 subscribers, so we really want to get to 2,000 as soon as possible. So have you not subscribed yet? Subscribe, invite your friends to subscribe, and also click the bell so that you get notified when we go live like this. And... I mean, I think this episode is going to be one of the most exciting ones yet. I know we say it every episode, but this one I'm specifically excited about because we're going to talk about Engels for his 200th birthday, which is super exciting. And then we're going to talk a little bit about conspiracy theories, which I think is one of the most talked about subjects. And I think it's really important that we have a socialist analysis on this as well. Um, so... Please comment while you're watching this, like this video, it really helps us get to more people and you know that we should get to as many people as possible with these. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the US elections because obviously it's a never ending story. Um, so uh, that's going to happen at the end as well. But let's start with the main theme of tonight, which is um, Friedrich Engels. So Toya, how are you doing? And what do you think about Engels? I'm actually really excited to uh, talk about Engels as well. Um, you know, a lot of young people who are coming around to socialist ideas are, are going back to these um, older thinkers um, to read some of their texts and, and learn about what they said. And so this 28th of November marks the 200 years since the birth of good old Freddie Engels. Um, he was a famous co-thinker of Karl Marx. Um, and together they developed the ideas that we still use today um, to understand not just how capitalism works, but how it can be overthrown, right? We're, we're trying to change the system um, and we want to replace that system with a socialist alternative, hence the international socialist alternative. Um, but he was not just Marx's sidekick. He was an incredibly innovative thinker. Um, he wrote a whole number of subjects on economics, history, and especially philosophy. Um, but I'm very excited to talk with our guest today about um, his works on the oppression of women. Um, and, you know, he didn't have the goal of just interpreting the world, but he too, like Marx, wanted to change the world. Um, and, you know, he lived and died many years ago, like we said his birth was 200 years ago, but it's super relevant today. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, it was a different time then, but his contributions to the socialist and workers movement remain relevant. Um, so today we're going to dive into his legacy, um, how he developed his key ideas and how they can be applied to the current situation. So I want to welcome Katya to the show from the Socialist Party in Ireland. Hey, how you doing? Great to be here. It's really good to have you here, Katya. Um, like, I have so many questions about Engels, and I think the, the first thing that we should do is kind of get the background. Who, who is Engels? Can you tell us a little bit about his life? Kind of, because also we talked about how it was 200 years ago. So what did the world that he analysed look like, and why is this relevant today? Yeah, that's a really good start, actually, because Engels became politically active in the early 19th century, which was really that period of the Industrial Revolution. So capitalism was still this dynamic developing system, very different from what we're facing today in many ways in terms of a system that is in crisis in every possible way, right? You had this rapid industrialization all the way throughout Europe and England being at the heart of that. And Engels, who was from Germany, arrives in the middle of all that when he's sent by his dad to work in one of the factories uh, that his dad owns in Manchester in the early 1840s. And as well as this economic change that is happening very rapidly, it's also a period of, of enormous political upheaval of revolutions on the one hand, you know, the French Revolution was still within, it was only 50 years ago, um, but even since you had the revolution, you know, you had all aftermath of the French Revolution as well as the revolution in the wave of 1830, 1848. Um, and the whole idea of, of new social classes coming to the fore in history and starting to play a role. So this whole idea that there are massive changes happening um, and was very much alive. 
And Engels really engages with that in terms of looking at how the world is changing around them and who are the, the, the historic forces that in the next period in this new system under capitalism are going to play a key, play a key, key role. Thanks, Katya. One of Engels' earlier works um, was something called The Condition of the Working Class in England, which is an incredible insight into the sheer misery that was the daily reality for working people of that time. Um, but Eng Engels wasn't um, just interested in documenting the hardships of these workers. You know, he wanted to explain why the poverty um, was part of capitalism, right? And we're, we're still constantly talking about this today. We don't want to just talk about how bad conditions are, but why the system we live in creates these bad conditions. But can you speak a little bit more about what capitalism looked like during that time and how Engels himself understood it? Yeah. So what happens is when he arrives in Manchester, he actually quite quickly breaks with his own bourgeois background and links in with working class people. Most of all, he falls in love with Mary Burns, who is a, an Irish working class woman uh, working in a factory in, uh, in, in a textile mill in, in Manchester. And she really introduces him to the lived reality of workers in that city. And what he discovers is these incredible conditions of hardship. Um, not just in the factories themselves, 12 hour working days or more, child labor and so on, all the, the, the horrors of, 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 of capitalist exploitation, but also that people are living in slums, you know, um, with the lack of sanitation, uh, you know, sewage in the streets, um, incredible overcrowding, uh, very poor uh, nutrition. And actually, in some ways, you can say, you know, you read this book and, and, and you can say, God, you know, it's nearly 200 years old. But actually, if you read the likes of Mike Davis today, Planet of Slums, and the description of the proliferation of slums all over the world, it's incredibly similar in terms of, 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 of the conditions that so many working class people globally still face today. Um, but I think, yes, one of the really cool things about the book is that it, it is a really sh sharp jacuzzi of, 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 of the ruling class, right? But beyond that, Engels goes into, why is this the case? Because on the one hand, you've got the socialization of labor, this incredible expansion of, of the, the capacity to produce things, to, to, to produce enough for everybody for the first time pro probably in history. But on the other hand, you've got the privatization of those means of production. So in the hands of very fewer and fewer uh, owners, uh, factory owners. And essentially what he's describing is this idea that the 1% of factory owners are able to get rich by exploiting the labor of, of, of workers who are forced to sell their labor force to those, uh, to those factory owners. And I think if you look today, that, that, that fundamental contradiction that he describes is so relevant for today because you think about the possibilities that we have today with technology with you know just the capacity to actually overcome hunger poverty on a world scale is better than ever before but what we see the reality of what we're seeing is that those at the top are creaming off an incredible amount of wealth that isn't used productively that isn't used for the good of everybody uh, and that inequality is actually worse than ever before yeah, I, I really think it's always interesting to see what those like original Marxist thinkers were writing about hundreds of years ago and compare it to today, because even though the situation, you know, like capitalism has changed so much, it's still the the underlying effects of it are still the same. And we see that, like, you know, like you said, with technology, we are in a very different but very similar position right now. And what I find the most interesting is that at the time, you know, like you said, Engels was pushed to see the conditions of the working class because of uh, like this love story they had. But generally, if you weren't working class at the time, there wasn't much that was written about the working class. And I think today as well, we see that even when people are exposed to the conditions of the working class, there's kind of like this sympathy um, of like, we need charity, we need to help them rather than, you know, giving them the agency because still the working class were the, the, the majority of the population. And I think what Engels did was really good in that respect because he didn't just look at the working class and go like, oh, that's so sad. He was like, 
he was also saying that the working class had power and the power to change it. So I was wondering kind of like, how like how did he see this power coming from and like in what way did he think they was going to manifest oh, i think the point you're making now is so so important and something that actually Engels doesn't get enough credit for <laughs> uh, we should give him due credit for this one right that idea that the working class that we as working class people have power over our own situation that we are an active part in the writing of our own history that is so central to everything that has written, been written since uh, about Marxism, you know? And he, he was one of the first people to highlight that. You know, he didn't invent socialism. Socialism was already being talked about in the early 19th century. But the way it was being talked about was in that kind of very um, moral way of capitalism is bad. It's, you know, what, look what it's doing to the majority of people. And socialism is good collective ownership of, of the means of production would be a much better way of organizing things. But what all of these thinkers, Saint-Simon in France, Robert Owens in England, there's many others, had in common is that what they weren't talking about is how do we get from one to the other, which is obviously very, very important. And so what they on, ended up doing was proposing, well, why don't we set up socialist colonies away from the capitalist system, like little islands of, 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 of paradise, um, that, that aren't connected in any way with what was be becoming a world system. And inevitably all these little islands just fell apart because you can't just escape from capitalism. We're in it, we're all living in it. And, and, and you can't just uh, turn, turn off, um, it, it, has, it doesn't have an on and off switch, let's say, <laughs> let's say that, right? W what Engels brings is a scientific al analysis of what is capitalism and how does it work? And obviously he develops that much further with Marx and Marx then writes eventually three big long volumes of capital that really go into the detail of all that. But he also brings that idea of because of, of, the, of, the, of the role of the working class in production, you also those conditions of socialization also lead to people realizing, workers realizing that they have interests in common not just economic interests, but also socially, culturally, that they are going to develop as a class in and of themselves with their own interests at heart and with the, with the need to get organized as a class. And that, that idea of the, the of the working class getting organized for itself is extremely powerful as a driving force in history. Yeah, it's super interesting to think about, you know, these people writing things so long ago and being, you know, kind of groundbreaking um, in their analysis. But to switch gears a little bit and focus in specifically on women, I mean, what Engels wrote during this time, um, you know, was, you know, kind of the first of its kind um, analysis on the origins of the oppression of women. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit you know, specifically about that, especially right now, we're seeing, um, you know, radicalizing women's movements across the globe, um, you know, whether it's about abortion, whether it's about healthcare, whether it's about um, equal pay. Um, and so I think what he wrote then is still super relevant today. Um, but he, he, he had the goal of showing that patriarchy is not a permanent feature of, you know, human society and how, you know, people say it's somehow rooted in our biology, you know, women are just naturally weaker or our nature. But what Engels was saying, it was actually, um, it had everything to do with the development of class society, um, bringing the analysis of oppression and linking it to class society. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that and like why this was so um, groundbreaking for its time and still relevant today? You're for fast forwarding in terms of, of Engels' own development and his writing to 1884, when he turns his attention to this question and writes a book about women's oppression and its origins. And I think it's actually important to highlight the context of this, because in 1884, you do have a workers' movement that has already developed rapidly, is organizing a huge amount, millions of workers in trade unions and politically organizing uh, workers as well. And women are increasingly being drawn into the workforce. And what you see in the workers' movement is the conservative side being against women being drawn into the workers' movement. Um, and the revolutionary side of the workers' movement actually arguing in favor of organizing women. And Engels, in this debate, 
sees his contribution as giving that a scientific theoretical basis, the need to organize women workers together with all of the, the workers in the workers' movement. So he writes this book in which he traces back where does actually women, women's oppression come from? Was it just invented by capitalism? No, it wasn't. The patriarchy predates capitalism. And but he pinpoints that it actually develops together with the development of private property, with the idea of, of hunter-gatherer societies no longer um, or starting to settle, agrarian societies developing, and therefore the uh, private property becoming an issue. And the need to pass on that private property to the next generation, an increase in the, the, the sexual division of labor, pushes women increasingly into an di economic disadvantage. And how that economic disadvantage then expresses itself in a multitude of other, other ways over the thousands of years that follow. So it's not just economic anymore. It's also social. It's cultural. It's, um, so, you know, women in, in, in culture for most of history haven't really had any representation and men painting us. <laughs> um, psychological, sexual, he really explains the depth of, of, of how that expression expresses itself for women today. And that's an incredibly powerful description by itself. But I think two really key things that come out of it for me, right, are one, women's oppression didn't always exist. Therefore, it doesn't have to always exist. It's something that is imposed by us, by the economic development that happened in the last instance, by how the means of productions, production were privatized. So if we want to change it, we need to also change how the economy is organized today, how capitalism is organized today. And in order to do that, women have common cause with other people who also suffer under capitalism. So it points to a united struggle of oppressed people, women, LGBTQ people, and so on, with exploited people, with the working class as a whole, and a united movement that is capable of taking capitalism as a system on and fighting for, for the socialization of the means of production, of the wealth that is there in society to be used for the good of all. And that that material basis will provide us then with a basis to challenge all exploitation and all prejudices. I think this is one of the main things that personally pushed me towards socialism. Like this book, The, the Origins of the Family, uh, The Origins of the Family, the State and Private Property, is one of the, the books that kind of like, you know, make it make sense in a way, because I think today, a lot of the times in the movements, especially when we intervene in movements for, you know, like the Black Lives Matter movement, movements against racism, against sexism, um, against homophobia. A lot of the times we get that question of what does it have to be? What does it have to do with socialism? What does it have to do with capitalism? And I think this book really analyzes it in a really, really interesting and scientific way as well. Obviously, it was written almost 200 years ago. So there are some details that are maybe a little bit old fashioned about it. There's some things that have been, you know, that they have changed a lot. But essentially, the, an the analysis in there is so relevant to today. And I think that connects with because we did see in the last decade a huge rise in feminist, like in the feminist movement. And we've seen loads of different movements that have arised. Like we talked about a little bit about like the abortion rights movement um, around the globe. Uh, the Me Too movement, the slut walks, all of these like movements that really show the kind of you know anger of women about the position of being still oppressed in society, in society that kind of prides itself on being so progressive and so like modern. And of course, when Engels wrote this, the society was very different. The position of women in society was very different and much worse than it is now uh, in most ways. But how do you think the ideas that we've written in this book are still relevant? First of all, for the movements that we have today, but also for the analysis and the kind of like the way to fight back against oppression. I think one of the key things that comes out of the book when he talks about capitalism specifically and how that how oppression of women expresses itself under capitalism is that he points so clearly to the contradiction that is at the heart 
of how capitalism uses women's oppression. So he describes on the one hand that for the first time since the start of private property thousands of years ago, capitalism as a system actually pushes women not into the home, but out of the home. It needs women as a labor force and therefore women are, you know, become workers uh, and therefore also go through the same process that workers as a whole went through of actually realizing we can get organized here, you know, we can fight back. Um, so he actually sees the idea of women being pushed out of the home in some way as a progressive point, right? He ob obviously acknowledges that women will be exploited like all other workers and so on. But he also says like, look, this is actually an opportunity for women to get organized collectively and to, to build movements fighting oppression. And actually, look what happened. You know, we're, we're now on the third wave of global uh, feminist movement. But on the other hand, he points to capitalism will still also use women to do all of the domestic labor, to do what is today called social reproduction. So the reproduction of the labor force, but everything that comes with it, the, the care work for the elderly, for young people, for the sick, and so on and so forth. And it's that contradiction that inevitably is gonna force women to come to the fore in struggles and to become the most radicalized sections of the working class. And I think we really see that playing out today. And what I just described in very abstract way there a minute ago, it's actually really concrete if you think about it, right? Because today, as a young woman, you are told on the one hand that you absolutely have to work. You can't stay home and look after your kids. No, you need to be working full time, at least, preferably a little bit more than that. But on the other hand, you also have to be a mother, have kids. I'm talking about the role models that were pushed, that, that pushed upon us, right? And, you know, parenting is more demanding than ever in terms of if you don't, haven't read five parenting handbooks before you have your child, oh my God, God forbid, you know? Um, on the one hand, you are told to be practical and, and, you know, and fit into the workforce and so on and so forth with your clothing. But it, on the other hand, there's an enormous pressure on how women look more so than ever, probably in the sense of spending money on clothes and so on and so forth. You know, you're told that, you know, there's no childcare available, but you have to go to work. You know, all these contradictions, they are actually lived every single day of our lives. And I'm just talking about the economic and social ones, but think about psychologically what is being done to women in terms of all of those pressures being piled on and how that is expressing itself on, 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 on so many levels, you know? And I think all of that is actually leading to the radicalization that we see today. I think the effects of the economic crisis of 2008 today leads to a massive radicalization of women saying, we, we can't take this anymore. This is, you know, there's too much pressure being put on us. We're being pulled in two directions at the same time, and we actually can't 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 deliver on all of those uh, of of those expectations. So I think it's really really relevant uh, how he describes that central contradiction that inevitably leads to radicalization of women. I think the other thing that is really really um, insightful in the book is the connection of the state and the role of the state, and the state not being a neutral organ, but actually that the state was invented as a mechanism to protect the ruling class, to protect the, the, the property owners, going back again to that, that those very early agrarian societies where he traces the, the development of the state first. But how then also that is linked to the use of violence and the brutalization of society. And he traces that you know, through time. But if you think about that today, what has imperialism, what has the ongoing wars all over the world done to us in terms of an acceptance of violence that is being pushed upon people and that is pushed upon men in particular, for instance, and how that also plays into per people's personal lives? Why do we, do we see such an increase in, in gender-based violence uh, in this day and age? Yes, because of the conditions people are forced to live in, the overcrowding, the fact that people can get away out of uh, uh, difficult relationships and so on. But also because violence itself has been normalized under capitalism. And I think the points he makes about the development of the state and how that is linked with violence really help us to understand some of the key issues that, uh, that we see today in the women's movement coming to the fore. For instance, it, it rings true with me when you look at uh, the 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 movement in Chile 
and that famous song that feminists in, in, in Chile performed, where they named the state as a culprit in the violence that is being perpetrated against women. And I think Engels actually really helps us to understand why that is the case. Thank you so much for joining us today, Katya. This has been an amazing discussion and hopefully an inspiring one for everyone who's watching this show, but particularly women. Um, it's nice to be able to discuss and read and analyze um, things that you feel that sometimes under the system you feel isolated with, you know, like, why do I feel like I need to do this? And, you know, all the questions about, um, do you have a husband? Do you have kids? You have to work, you have to, um, you know, provide for your family, take care of your family. All of these types of things with the oppression of women can be explained, but also discussing Engels' analysis of the state in general and the system itself and how relevant it is today, even though we are celebrating the birth of him from 200 years ago. I mean, it just shows how long this system has been a problem, how long this struggle um, and need, you know, the need to, to, to fundamentally change things has been going on throughout um, society. So I want to thank you again, Katya. Hopefully we can have you on again real soon. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed the discussion. So earlier, we got a chance to speak with Albert from the Left Socialist Party in Austria, which is a part of the International Socialist Alternative. Um, and he spoke about Engels' contribution to Marxist thought and his writings on science and philosophy. Hello and warm greetings from Vienna. Just a few thoughts on Frederick Engels and his contribution to Marxism. When we talk about Engels and Marxism, we also have to talk about Marx as well. But it should also be the other way around because for decades there have been a two-man party as a core for a bigger mass revolutionary party, and both of them influenced each other. It was Engels who studied the modern capitalist system in its worldwide capital in Manchester, England. Out of this, Engels wrote his first book about the condition of the working class in England, a book that is still considered as a pioneer of modern sociology. And it was again Engels who brought Marx on the path of the importance of economics as a base for the later scientist socialism. I want to pick up two books. The first is the anti During. In the 1870s, anti-Marxist to anti-Semitic tendencies increased within the social democracy in Germany. This was expressed in the dissemination of the private lecturer Eugen Düring within the party. As a base for that was the lack of a formulated worldview of Marx and Engels, in the sense that they did not give a concrete picture or design of a future socialist society. Düring was able to offer this gap in a society still strongly dominated by religious needs. As a political response to this, Wilhelm Liebknecht asked Engels to write a series of articles in the German paper Vorwärts. These were planned and discussed by Marx and Engels. In the Austrian section, we published the paper Vorwärts, where can, you can still find the thinking and ideas of Frederick Engels. This is finally resulted in the book Eugen, Herrn Eugen Thüring's Umwälzung der Wissenschaft in 1878, and finally in released form in 1880, first in French, the development of socialism from utopia to science. Until today, these works are widely used as a popular description of Marxism. But the anti during was also far-sighted. In it, there is a description of the consequences of industrialization on the environment. Just to quote, let us not flatter ourselves too much with our human victories over nature. For every such victory, she takes her revenge on us. The revenge is that what we see nowadays on global warming and the ecological catastrophe around the world. The next book is The Origin of the Family, Private Property and State. It was written by Engels in 1884. In it, he closes a significant gap in the application of the dialectical materialistic method to society and social, social developments. Far ahead of his time, he described the role of women and the function of their oppression in a class society. Just a few months ago, 
European archaeologists and anthropologists has to rewrite history. With new technical methods, they found out that a grave of a Viking fighter was long wrongly believed as male, but was female. In Viking society, which is often presented and described as a very male society, also fighters and rulers were female. As a reason for this long-lasting mistake, it was said that scientists sorted and interpreted their finds alongside their own beliefs as a result of their surrounding society they are living in. But it's not only that. Also the well-known National Geographic Society published an article some weeks ago on the same topic. You can find it in the internet. In 2018, a 9,000-year-old grave was discovered in Peru, Latin America. The corpse was found together with a rich arsenal of stone tools for hunters. Now, technical methods, methods also discovered that it was a female hunter. Further studies showed that 30 up to 50% of the big game hunters on both Americas in the Stone Age have been females, something which couldn't have been sought uh, some years ago. Both are examples what Engels said and wrote in 1884. And just coming to an end, a quote of Marx about Engels. You know that everything comes late for me firstly, and secondly, I always follow in your footsteps. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always so interesting to hear more. And I specifically like the part about science because, you know, it's like a lot of people when they talk about socialism, they think about this, like we talked a little bit about, about before, about like the utopian kind of version of it and showing that it's grounded in reality and it's a philosophical and scientific method to analyze the world in a way that doesn't just analyze it, but also allows us to move forward towards changing the system that exploits us is so important. And I think Engels was probably one of the best writers about this. Uh, it's always interesting to hear about him and hear more about what he was saying. But speaking about science, I want to move to kind of like the other side of the coin when it comes to it, because we are going to talk a little bit, a little bit about conspiracy theories now. And I think a lot of them are connected to science in the way that they reject a lot of the scientific knowledge that we have today, which I think personally is, is very, very interesting because for a really long period of time, I think humanity relied on science and relied on trusting science in an absolute manner and now we see a lot of working class people rejecting these ideas that have been ingrained in us for so long now I'm not saying it's correct to do that or if it makes sense to do that from a scientific perspective but i think it's interesting to kind of have a think about why this rejection exists like you know when we talk about the pandemic and we see all of those protests against wearing a mask or saying that the pandemic is a hoax or all the way to vaccines saying that vaccines don't help and like that they cause other medical issues instead which i think is is really scary if you think about that um but like why why do you think this is something that is so prominent right now I mean, I think it goes along with this, you know, um, anti-establishment type of mood and like, um, I need to think on my own because everything I'm, I, I, I'm hearing, um, it doesn't, you know, uh, speak to my interests. It doesn't speak to me. Um, I need to, you know, be a free thinker. Um, but yeah, it goes way too far in the other direction. I mean, right now in the U.S., the big one is the QAnon. People may have heard about it. And it's like, it's like they've taken every conspiracy theory and put it under this one umbrella of like, we just believe everything that people say is wrong. Um, and it's kind of taken the country by storm, you know, very far right elements of it. Um, but yeah, scary is like an understatement with what it is. And, you know, we saw it with the anti-maskers, um, you know, anti-vaccine stuff saying that, you know, the the pandemic is a hoax and they're going to create a vaccine that's a microchip to put in us. Um, 
but it does like you, you know, you think about it. Well, like, uh, uh, obviously the pandemic isn't a hoax. Obviously we do need a vaccine, but do we need, you know, the, who's going to create this vaccine? It's going to be these pharmaceutical companies that make millions and millions and billions of dollars. And so, you know, on the one hand, it's crazy to think that all of these people dying is a hoax, but on the other hand, you do question, um, the, the, I don't want to say the motives, but you do question the, the, the powers that be that control all of the science that control all of the, the research and, and um, what benefits they're going to get um, when they do finally come out with a vaccine, when they do come out with, um, you know, ways to handle the pandemic. Yeah. And I think, I think I really agree with that. And I think it's really easy to dismiss people and say, call them fascists and like just move along with our lives. But this movement is growing for a reason. It's growing because people have been hurt by the system over and over again. And the establishment and its institutions, which include all of these private companies that you talk about that are creating vaccines now, but are not gonna, you know, give the vaccine away for free, even though it's a pandemic that's hurting everyone. They're gonna make countries and make people pay a lot of money to get those vaccines, even though if they could just produce it for free. And, you know, we had an organized way of distributing it so that the people who are at most at the most risk get it first, not the people who have the most money to spend on it, then we would have a completely different reality. And I think that it's not it's not crazy to question those institutions. It's not crazy to question the medical institution when, you know, when you need to pay so much money to, especially in the US, when you need to pay so much money to like heal yourself. And then sometimes it doesn't work, but you are still in debt. And even in countries that have socialized medicine, it's still, you know, there's long queues um, before you can go and, 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 you know, get the treatment you need. A lot of the times the treatment that you need is really expensive for the country as well. And it's just all of these private companies benefiting from every single medical system. And I think, obviously, when there isn't this kind of analysis that can explain why this is happening and that the problem isn't science, the problem isn't the facts that we know about the world, it's the people who control the resources in the world and the people who control the production and the way that things are distributed in the world that are the problem, it's very easy for the far right to come in and kind of, you know, take advantage of that inherent mistrust of working class people who are not fascist, who are not far right, but are looking for answers and looking to kind of find a solution to the problem that they are having and trying to find answers. And I think what's really interesting about QAnon especially, I think, uh, but generally in conspiracy theory is the idea of like, do your research You know, we're not going to spoon feed you the information. We're going to let you go on YouTube and watch 70 hours of this film that was created (laughs) by a nut job. Um, Just so that you believe us that the, like, we were not going to tell you that the world is flat. We are going to make you come to that conclusion yourself. And I think there's a brilliant way that the far right can enter working class communities that are looking for these answers because you go and research it and you're given false information that is there in order to convince you to move to that side of the political map because the the left and a lot of places in most places around the world isn't like is trying to even infiltrate those um those communities and what you get is people who genuinely do their research from the resources that are wrong and false and come to conclusions that in some ways, like you said, all right, that there are that there is a conspiracy, the conspiracy to create profit for billionaires. That is the conspiracy. But instead, they believe that you know someone uh, like is is trying to control the world just because they like to have a laugh. And you know, I think it also connects to kind of Trump and Bolsonaro and the whole really far right ideas like climate change doesn't exist and things like that like how can we think that climate change doesn't exist look at 20 years ago and how the climate was but it's so easy to kind of once you don't trust the establishment and you have all of this fake information fed into you it's very easy to feed you more and more and more of it right i mean they'll they'll say things like um 
whether it be a vaccine or a Green New Deal, um, the only reason they want us to do this is to make money. The only reason they want us to take a vaccine is to make money. The only reason they want you to buy solar panels is to make money. Absolutely. They do want you to make money. They're not worried about, um, you know, stopping a, a, a global pandemic, because if they were, then they would allow people to stay home and continue to give them stimulus and, and money to live if they were actually worried, along with um, coming up with a vaccine. If they really cared about the environment, they, meaning the, you know, ruling elite, the capitalists, as we call them, if they really cared about the environment they would stop extracting the, you know, dirty energy, the oil, the gas, and they would start the process. But yes, they do want to make money. And I think, you know, um, one thing that is kind of adding to all of this, and we're seeing this in the US and in, in Congress right now, they're um, questioning, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and the role that social media has played. You know, Twitter has, um, you know, stopped a lot of Trump's tweets from going out um, recently because he's, you know, uh, basically talking about conspiracy. Yeah, talking about conspiracy theories. Um, but Instagram, Facebook, they've stopped using hashtags because they don't want this to continue. But it has been proven that when you search for these types of things, they're going to push that 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 information onto you, you know, to go with their algorithms. And so, you know, people who think they are doing their independent research, like you said, are actually independently researching things that are continuing down that rabbit hole, if you will, of just, you know, the same, yeah, conspiracy style information over and over again. Um, but a solution to that, right, is um, uh, 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 a socialist analysis on the one hand, but a, a strong workers movement that can really call out the truth, which is the capitalists do want to um, make money off of these, you know, uh, solutions, if you will. Um, but what we need to do is we need to have ownership over the solutions. We need to have ownership over the vaccine. We need to have ownership over, um, you know, saving the environment. Um, and so I think that's kind of, you know, where the divide is. Who's going who's gonna to come up with the solutions? The workers should come up with the solutions. Um, who's going to benefit from the solutions? We're going to benefit from them. And so therefore, we need to, um, we need to uh, yeah, have control over things. Yeah, and I think you mentioned Congress a little bit, and I think that's a good kind of segue into talking about the US for a little bit, because obviously this side is very big, particularly in the US, even though it's gaining some momentum outside of it as well. But I think the connection to Trump is particularly interesting and in like the way that he kind of pushes it. And, you know, even the way that he's treating this election is as if it's kind of a, some sort of a conspiracy theory to get him out of his position. So I was wondering, can you update us a little bit about what's happening? Yeah, so much is happening. I'm, I'm sorry, Ara, we have to talk about this all the time. But it's just it's, it, it's just a crazy situation. I mean, you know, we talked uh, um, last week about, you know, counting the votes and everything. But you know, Trump is officially uh, has officially lost. Right. Um, Biden is the president elect. Um, but there are processes that need to um, happen for this transition um, to go smoothly. And of course, your boy Donald is not trying to let that happen. You know, I mean, even little things like having Joe Biden come to, you know, uh, you know, meetings uh, to see what's going on. Donald Trump has to allow him to do that. Um, those types of things aren't happening. Um, but I mean, on the other side, you know, kind of let's put Donald Trump to the side with his QAnon folks, right? On the other side, we're seeing in, within the Democratic Party, um, there being questions of what a Biden pre pre presidency, excuse me, is going to look like. Um, so, uh, you know, no, we didn't just elect the president this time around. We elected a lot of people to Congress as well. And um, a lot of uh, progressives have joined what we've been calling the squad, which was led by um, AOC, who's a congresswoman in, um, in New York. And a lot of different people have joined the squad as progressive um, leaders, members of the Democratic Socialists of America. But AOC herself has just been feeling so... Um, kind of tired and, and demoralized um, from trying to fight within the Democratic Party. And so what Socialist Alternative has been talking about a lot is, um, you know, what this squad of progressive leaders need to do to be able to actually put 
you know, pass legislation that they're talking about. They're not going to be able to do that under Biden. I mean, he's already appointed Republicans to his cabinet. I mean, how much more of a fake Democrat, you know, can he be? He's 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 appointing these Republicans to um, uh, uh, lead the work. And so, um, you know, we're, we're, we've been able to have really good discussions with people about this, what it's going to take to have an actual um, uh, progressive next four years. And it's going to take these progressives actually leaving the Democratic Party. Yeah, and I think, you know, I saw, well, I, I wanted to say one of the most embarrassing things that I saw this week, and I think you can't top the part of the Republicans holding a press conference as an actual parking lot that they confused with the Four Seasons, which is an end. Four Seasons the, least... landscaping. It was a Four Seasons, Yara. Let's be honest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll get, I'll get the T-shirt next time. Uh, but like, I, I think that there's at least if we need to talk about the election constantly at least it's an endless resource of hilarity okay but on the other side of ridiculous but maybe not as funny is seeing the democrats already blaming the result obviously biden won we even though trump is trying to pretend like there's still a chance for him biden won but if you look at the Congress, like you said, there wasn't like it, it, it wasn't great for the Democrats at all. Um, and generally with this election on all fronts, the Democrats have not done as well as was predicted or as they thought they would. Um, and you're already seeing them blame socialism for it, saying that you can't. Well, they shouldn't the blame socialism, Yara. Did you see the breakdown of who didn't get elected and who did? Everybody who's against Medicare for all didn't get elected. And everyone who is for Medicare for all did get elected. I mean, it just shows that the American people are wanting progressive change. You know, we talked last week about how in places where they voted for Trump, they still passed a higher minimum wage. They still passed, you know, a tax the rich legislation. I mean, what what is wrong with these Democrats? If you just if you just take up the legislation that the people want, clearly they'll vote for you. And it's, it's, it's also crazy because we can all see it. Like it's, this information is not, is not hidden anywhere. It's out there. We can see why people are voting for people and we can see what positions the people that were voted in have. So it's just, it just makes no sense to come out with that. But it does make sense because that's what they want. What they want is to push away Every, anyone who says socialism, anyone who has these positions, because they're frightened that they're going to have another Bernie Sanders. And, you know, like, it, it's frightening for them to have someone like AOC, who is very outspoken, go up the ladder and kind of push those ideas, even though, like, obviously, AOC doesn't go as far as she should go and as far as she could go easily. But it, it kind of, like, I think that statement that I think she made a few years ago of like, she shouldn't be in the same party as Biden. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that is kind of like the proof for it. And lead the way, lead the way for the working class to a new party, you know, uh, something outside of, of, of the Democrats. And I mean, even on a local level, you know, our favorite socialist in office, Shama Sawant, has proven that that is possible. You can do that. You can run a successful campaign and be held accountable by the people who voted you in as opposed to large corporations. Um, AOC, Bernie Sanders, Julia Salazar, all of these people are in the best position to do that. And they just they won't. They keep their foot in the in the door of the Democrats. Yeah, and I think obviously everyone is kind of like breathing a sigh of relief with the result. I mean, for now, we don't know how far Trump is going to take it, but we see like kind of the Republicans either shutting them out about it or kind of giving them very silent support. So I, I, don't, I don't know how far you think that's going to go, but I think the kind of internationally and I'm assuming in the US as well, we see like this kind of like fresh air suddenly being breathed into our lungs you know like I I saw last week after the the election result was announced uh there were mass pro that th there have been mass protests in Israel we talked about it a little bit there a couple of weeks ago um against Netanyahu against the prime minister and 
you should have seen it. The entire, the, the whole protest was just American flags, signs saying uh, Trump out, Netanyahu, you're next. And it's just, it's just amazing to see how emboldened other movements are by this loss. And I think also it's interesting to talk about how kind of the effect on the far right is. On the one hand, it might embolden the far right because they might feel more marginalized. But on the other hand, they're they, hopefully they will be marginalized. And if there is this, you know, new movement, new party, they can take on that vacuum on the left. They can build a party that's not a corporate party, that's a real workers' party. And then there could be an extra fight, not just against the people on the far right, but also against the ideas of the far right. There are, like we said about the cons- like the conspiracy theories, like there are going deeper and deeper because there's no other explanation, because no one else is saying what the actual problem is and what actually needs to be done. Yeah, so a new party is something that is crucial for the workers movement in the U.S. And Socialist Alternative um, has been calling for for us to, um, you know, have a new party here in the U.S., something outside of the Democrats and the Republicans. We just recently published an article. Um, You can check it out um, and read all about our ideas and, and how we think we can move forward with that. Um, But what a new party can do is not just get people elected to office, right? A new party um, can help uh, uh, social movements and help fight for policies that we really need um, outside of just elected officials. And so now for the shout out of the week is going to the International Socialist Alternative in Sweden. I'm not going to try to speak Swedish for you, um, but we just had a huge victory um, in uh, the school department there. So in Lulio, um, they've been fighting school closures for many years now, and, and in total, they've already seen 12 school, clo- stu- school closures. Um, but because of the mass movement that we've been able to um, participate in and help build, there's been a huge fight back with protests and actions, and they were able to um, force um, the region to hold a referendum, and they won 92% um, to save their schools. This is a huge victory and just shows the power of the working class um, and how we can fight for things when we organize organize and build movements. So shout out to the Swedish um, section. Great job. Keep up the good work. Also, a special shout out to our Brazilian section um, who's holding elections this Sunday. We cannot wait for the results. I want to thank everyone for watching World to Win today. Next week, we have an episode about the um, day to acknowledge um, violence against women. Um, And so we're going to have a special feminist episode to talk all about that. So be sure to join us, um, subscribe to our channel and share our videos. Thanks so much. This is World to Win. Every Sunday, we broadcast with speakers from across the globe, bringing you the latest news and analysis on the fast moving global events from a socialist perspective. Subscribe to the International Socialist Alternatives YouTube page and click the bell to get notified when we go live for a new episode. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram because there's a lot to do and we have a world to win. When they fight! When they fight! When they fight! Solidarity!